welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're in Sussex for the Sunday Times, shooting pheasants and deer. We're finding out how they call in foxes in Scandinavia in a funny foreign language. We discover how you can drink water from your local river without dying. First, nous talent à Paris pour la chasse aux perdix. We're going to Paris to shoot partridge. Welcome to Browning's Research and Development Department. It may look very much like the beginning of a nice day's shooting, but don't be fooled, this is serious stuff. Under the microscope is the new Browning 725, the new Browning clothing range, and a £45,000 B25 from Browning's Custom Shop in Belgium. To make sure the guns and the clothing get a good workout, we're at a game day on the outskirts of Paris. It's mostly partridge, but there will be the chance of pheasants, duck and grieve too. That's the song thrush to you and me, which is legal to shoot here and delicious to eat. At the first drive, the Belgian guns line up for the French shoot with the chance of some very British weather. An interesting combination. So what makes a traditional French shoot apart from a smart hat? L'endroit c'est déjà le biotope, 700 hectares de plaine euh, aménagés en bande de maïs euh, et de la moutarde euh, alternée, donc qui fait que on peut chasser la perdrix grise et la perdrix rouge euh, du mois de septembre au mois de novembre, fin, fin novembre. Euh, donc on peut faire des battues, on fait des battues, on chasse à peu près trois, quatre fois en battue par semaine, euh, ce qui nous permet de pouvoir euh, sur ces 700 hectares de plaine euh, euh, chasser euh, ces deux espèces. Quoi. The birds are driven through the crops from a mile or so away. By the time the partridges reach us they are travelling at a fair old pace and a decent height. We're next to William. His R&D responsibility is clothing and it's not just about how it looks. All the products are designed by shooters. So we have a team internally, we are all uh, hunters and, and shooters in Browning. So we designed the, the product uh, in-house in uh, using our experience on the field and we test them uh, extensively. So yes, we do. Uh, it's not a designer. Of course, designer uh, have their word on the, let's say, uh, things could be look nice, but uh, the, all the technical features are designed by uh, shooters. One piece of design he really likes is the integrated recoil pads for those big bag days. We use these gel pads uh, to reduce the recoil. They are just there. They, they are very uh, uh, fit and, um, and slim, so uh, it doesn't affect uh, the way you aim at the, the, the birds. But when this day with a lot of shoots, it's uh, perfect. Also, the look here is a little bit nice with a bit uh, with the quilt and the very large pockets. Uh, it's a perfect jacket, and we have also a vest that goes with it, very nice as well. So we'll try it on today and uh, hope uh, have a good day with it. At the end of the drive, the birds are laid out for the guns to admire and appreciate. We're expecting a bag in excess of 200 today, so it's a good start with some fast shooting. We move further up the field for the second drive, and we hear the distant calls of the beaters in what seems to be the next province. We now share a peg with Martin Bouquet. He is doing invaluable work assessing the balance of the new B725 Hunter Grade 5. This gun is in addition to the two 725 models already on offer. It will not be available until the new year, so start saving that Christmas cash for this very smart gun. We had a, a Sporter one, a Hunter one. And we had to, uh, to enlarge our range uh, with a, a high level, a uh, grade 5 one. And then we will uh, also uh, uh, present the, the light version uh, of the B725 uh, to have a, a, a bigger range. On the engraver you have uh, a super engraver, uh, a duck, duck models on one side and you have uh, pheasants on, on the other side. And then the stock. You have a Grade 5 uh, stock model, so uh, a really uh, fine, fine stock, fine wood that you uh, have on this model. In the meantime, Martin needs to put the Hunter G5 through its paces, plus his Winchester cartridges. He is shooting well. Voila! A left and right. Or an double, which sounds cool. It's another good drive, and there is lots of shooting. This is like a British driven shoot, but the French character of the day is unmistakable. 
we now head back to the house and drop down to the next drive. First, the guns walk through the maze before preparing for drive three. This time we join Lionel. He is in charge of the custom shop in the factory in Liège, and it's a fascinating place, resonating to the sound of the engravers, and with shelves and shelves of hand-selected wood ready to be brought to life. If you're watching this on YouTube, click on the link to see our film about it. The B25 Lionel is shooting with today would cost up to £45,000 and it's one of a pair. But why spend so much money on a gun? You can go and do uh, London to Brighton in a, in a Vauxhall and you can drive uh, London to Brighton in a Porsche or an uh, Aston Martin. It's just something different, so it's, it's a luxurious handmade overhander shotgun. It takes about two years and hundreds of man-hours to produce a piece of art that shoots straight. And it's Lionel's job to make sure each customer gets exactly what he or she wants. My goal is to make the perfect gun for, for the customer. And uh, I think we make a uh, few people very happy, so uh, job's done. The French-speaking Labradors do their job and once again the bag is presented to the guns. We now adjourn to the house for food and a little wine, which is much appreciated by the folk here. Talk around the table is about the escalating price of birds. No change there then. After lunch, the drives continue to deliver some fantastic sport. Again, Martin finds the partridges and not many get past his right side. The weather was not there, but uh, the partridges were there, really. And I got, uh, not a doublé, but uh, it's for the next, next one. Some grey partridges are shot on this drive and a few song thrushes. First, you roast them, then flambe them. With one drive to go, Jean-Christophe and his team have delivered some great sport. So, does that explain why he's wearing what looks like a hat he's stolen off Postman Pat? Or should that be Facteur Patrice? La, la casquette d'un garde particulier français, quoi, un garde de chasse particulier. Voilà, tout simplement, il a pas de... Il a juste euh, ce petit corps de chasse qui fait que, voilà, c'est... Euh, qui rappelle la France, Qui rappelle, euh, oui, aussi, et le, la loi, c'était l'emblème de la loi chez les, chez les gardes de chasse. Quoi. William may be about six foot three, but even he can't see the partridges coming across the top of the maize crop on the last drive. Quick reactions are needed here unless the birds come down the line. William makes it look easy. This French shoot has been the same but different. All over Europe, driven game styles have their own identities. The Browning guys have shot well here today and are pleased with how their guns and gear perform in all conditions. All that's left is another tradition, the laying out of the birds. The bag is 220 and it must take a certain mathematical brain to be able to create such symmetry. It looks both impressive and respectful. Well, I mentioned it during that piece, but if you'd like to watch our film about how they make those beautiful guns at Browning in Liège, then click on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube and you'll go straight through to the film. Now, from La Belle France to the Belle of the Ball, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. Bird and animal attacks have been making the news. A teenager whose hawk attacked a toddler has been arrested by police. A two-year-old in Hampshire had to have part of an ear reattached by doctors after the Harris hawk attacked him. Last week, a Harris hawk in Scotland attacked a terrier, tearing part of its tongue. The bird was later destroyed. Falconers are fearful that these two incidents will lead to calls for a ban on birds. The two incidents that we've had recently are down to inexperienced people, flying hawks, where they really shouldn't have been. Harris hawks have been used for the last 20 years in public demonstrations across the country at game fairs, etc., and have been flown in front of millions of people without incident. Meanwhile, a coarse angler from East Sussex was attacked in his tent by a fox. 41-year-old Andrew Thomas will have scars for life after the incident, which only ended when he squeezed the fox's snout to stop it breathing. America has a new war. 
the US Department of Defense and the American Wildlife Conservation Society has joined forces to combat the illegal wildlife trade in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of the problems is American soldiers buying hats made from snow leopards. So the society has produced this video aimed at informing US military personnel about the consequences of buying illegal wildlife products when deployed or stationed overseas. If you're voting in the police commissioner elections in England and Wales on the 15th of November, then watch out for some of the candidates. Animal rights loony organisations I4 has got more than 50 of them to agree to enforce the fox hunting and coursing ban. Among the Labour, Lib Dem and Independent candidates are six antis from the Conservative Party, standing in Greater Manchester, Cleveland, South Wales and Surrey. To find I4's webpage, Google I4 and 79491, then follow the link. George Digweed is the new brand ambassador for the SENS ProFlex digital range of custom electronic shooters plugs. With 20 world titles, 16 European titles and 10 World Cups to his name, George is a long-term user of earmuffs. He will initially use the SENS ProFlex digital on his shoots, wirelessly interfacing with the shoot radios. Pure Tone has been designing and manufacturing in the UK since 1976. For more on the SENS range, visit sensdigital.com. The Moorland Association has a new chairman. It's Robert Benson who takes over the organisation representing owners and managers of over one million acres of moorland in England and Wales. Formerly at Lowther Estates, Robert is a self-employed Cumbrian-based sporting and conservation manager. The Countryside Alliance has launched a young countryside writer competition. It wants to give 12 to 18 year olds with passion for the countryside a chance to write for its membership magazine. All the entrants need to do is submit 300 words on what the British countryside means to them and what their favourite aspects are. From farming, field sports, local food, the changing seasons, conservation to just walking the dog. Email your story to news at countryside-alliance.org by Tuesday the 2nd of April 2013. And finally, an American police officer shows his cool when a moose gets stuck in a swing. The sheriff's sergeant from Utah helps cut the animal loose, but will the animal gore him? In the end, he gets away with it. Even the sergeant says it's lucky that everything works out and the moose survives. That's crazy. You're pretty brave. <laughs> you are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David, beating me to the haircut there. Now we're off to Sussex to a gourmet pub to look at a whole lot of journalists with their noses in the trough. I'm not selling this, am I? This is how you get the media to love shooting. At the Horse Guards Inn in Petworth, there is a seven-course game menu being appreciated by food writers from the likes of the Sunday Times and lovefood.com. Once they've polished off the bullshot, game scotch, quail eggs, Vietnamese-style game broth, rabbit livers, wood sorrel and rabbit dumplings, it's going to be an early night. Not just for the benefit of good digestion, but because at first light they'll be up a high seat or walking gingerly through the woods experiencing deer stalking for the first time. Every journalist is allocated an experienced stalker. We're joining Lucas, who writes for the Sunday Times. He is being looked after by Jack Smallman, who runs South Downs Venison and Game. Yeah, it's really um, very exciting. It's also really nice just being, you know, being out here at this time in the morning, actually. Just, uh, you know, out among nature. Unfortunately, the weather is rubbish. Visibility is down to just 20 yards, and although we can hear a rutting buck, there's no chance of seeing him. Jack has honed his own selection of calls, which seem to work impersonating a new buck on the block and a youngster. With no chance or promise of a shot, we resort to Plan B. While he's still out here, if we can, we sneak down the side of the wood. Come back, right, right. Try and come back with the wind still in our favour and try and get a visual on it. Um, hopefully we'll see some does and maybe a prick it with him, we might get a shot, but we shall see. 
The fog gives us as much of an advantage as the deer and we actually get quite close to the group. Silhouettes pass in front of us and a new buck has joined the party by the sounds of it. Antlers clash in the distance. Incredibly, a young buck, an ideal cull animal, materialises out of the fog. Jack gets set up. He watches as opportunities come and go as the fog ebbs and flows. As the buck passes by us broadside, we prepare for the shot, but it never comes, and with good reason. Did you see that? Unbelievable. When he went down there, he was safe, but like ish. He wasn't brilliant, then he came out to here, where I'd have quite happily shot him. I could see it with my naked eye, went up through the scope, could not see it. It did disappear. It just vanished. Every time I looked through, I was like, right, I can just see a silhouette. When I looked through the scope, just couldn't see a thing. And then when it came back here, well, I could see it as clear as day, but there's just too much skyline behind and villages and everyone else. So I was hoping it was going to come around. If it came across and back in to try and come back across the track, I'd have had it, but it's decided to carry on up the field. Oh. Next on the Game to Eat menu is a local pheasant shoot where we can grab a word with Chef Lee Maycock and ask him why it's important for the Countryside Alliance to drag journalists around muddy fields and woodland. I think they've all seen enough and read enough and heard enough. I think they just want to do it first hand by actually getting them into high seats in the mornings. Um, to get them, you know, to that whole experience of, of being up in a high seat sort of six o'clock in the morning, watching the sun come up, seeing the deer on the horizon is fantastic. It's not the sort of thing you do every day so they can write from the heart when they actually put these stories together, they can actually do it as first-hand experience and they can speak with depth of knowledge. All the guests seem to be enjoying the experience. Most of them have some understanding of the importance of game and where it comes from. However, the name of the game today is to make the meat accessible to a wider audience and they have the power to do that. For me, it was a really eye-opener. It's nice to see the animals being taken and know that they will be used. And for me, that's the most important thing to think of this as, although it is a bit of sport, it's also to think of it as food. The more we can do, uh, both in food media and both retailers and producers uh, and, and other organisations, the more we can do to promote game and make it accessible. So sometimes people are going to get put off by trying to roast a whole pheasant bird and when they're used to a chicken. I think we need to look at what's happened with say things like duck where it's broken down into component parts so you've got sort of quick things to stir fry. People think of it, think of it like that. They plan meals, not necessarily ingredients. And so we need to sort of give the consumer a broader range of choice and help and advice and recipes and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, the pheasant comes from Georgia. I've been banging on all day about the sort of, we can get some interesting spices in there. We can think about star anise and cinnamon and, you know, saffron and sort of, these are the things that come from the region where the birds are originally from. So, you know, people should think it's not just game chips. The drive is reasonably good with the dogs working well. Even the aptly named Peanut gets in on the act. The next stop is Jack's Chiller, where the guys have a chance to see the deer prepared. They are now on familiar territory and enjoy asking the butchers about cuts and preparation. It appears the writers have had an eventful day and Lucas has embraced everything that was on offer, even just being in the great British countryside. As of a nation that still, you know, however urban we've become, still has huge swathes of countryside that are managed by people who live in the country, whether they're farmers or people who run shoots. Um, you know, that's, that's a very important part of our, of our sort of national character, I suppose, and, and it's something that we really should be preserving and supporting and um, you know, looking after. So it's been, as much as anything, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a lovely day out in the country, actually, with an early start. <laughs> This is the second time Jack has had the opportunity to take people from the foodie press out on field to fork adventure and he believes we are making real progress with promoting game. I think the public are now coming round to the idea that we've got in the UK an absolutely amazing product sat out there, got to be managed. Um, it's not just for the quality of the deer and keeping the herd numbers under control, it's as much for the we're looking after human and farming interests as well. So certainly down here in the South Downs, we're trying to produce that and touch wood, we're, um, we're doing okay. If you want to know more about the work of the Game to Eat campaign, visit www.countrysidealliance.org.uk. Well, if you like Lee, you can see another of our films. We went grouse shooting with him in the summer. Just click on the screen. Next, 
we're off to our bushcraft expert, Johnny Crockett, for a top tip on how to drink water from the river. You can die of thirst faster than you can die of hunger in the wilds. Water may be more abundant than food, but it needs to be clean. After years of trying all kinds of different filters and techniques, I've settled on the simplest and the lightest. What I need to get is some water to make the soup, to make the tea, to make the stew. And for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this river water. Now in the river, all sorts of things. We've got turbidity, which you can see is all the, the brownie stuff in the, in the water. It's the bits of leaf, the dead insects, the shopping trolleys. Then I've got parasitic worms and protozoas and parasitic cysts. I've got viruses, bacteria, uh, potentially got chemicals in there. Um, I'm hoping, because we're in Devon, there's not too much radiation, but you never know. So what I'm going to use to filter out the turbidity and uh, any of the larger particles is a Milbank bag. This is something that the military uh, have used for years. And what you do is you, you soak this in the water until it's properly wet all the way through, keep squeezing it out so that it's soaked, absolutely soaked. Then what you do is you fill it up with water right the way up to the top and then you leave it until the water gets down to that black line and that just rinses it through. So let's fill this one up. There we go. So I'm going to wait for that one to get down to the black line and then that one I can just put in like that and that's taking all the turbidity out. Now that doesn't make it good to drink, all that makes it is filtered, it's not purified. So to purify it I can go down one of two routes. I can either use chemicals like potassium permanganate, iodine, chlorine or I can boil it. And boiling it is what I'm going to do. Gentle, rolling, simmering boil for about four minutes. And that should be enough. That's certainly enough for my cup of tea anyway. So I'm now going to tip this lot away. And do another one. We're bringing out a whole DVD with Johnny later in the month. Watch the programme for details. Now... Our old friend Ulf from Scandinavia has brought out his own DVD about how to call in foxes. Let's take a peek. We met the star of this new DVD, Ulf Lindroth, when we went on these ice field shooting trip to Denmark. He is a phenomenal shot and it is no surprise he won the field shooting competition. A passionate shooter and all-round good guy, he has brought out Fox Calling, the right sound at the right place. Filmed on location in Sweden, Norway and Denmark, it is in Swedish but has English subtitles. Ulf describes all his kit and how he uses it for the best results, including how to stop a fox in the right place to get a good shot. It is 93 minutes long and expensive at £30, but then damage from foxes can be expensive too. Visit www.pantheon.se to order it. From DVDs to the wider world of YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. To the USA for Top Hunting Video of the Week, which is the best female taxidermist in the South with more than 25,000 views. At once scary, hilarious, gross and sweet, it tells the story of Amy Ritchie, who is a hunter, a piano prodigy and a champion taxidermist. The interview takes place while she skins a fox. Staying in the USA, 2012 Feral hog hunting highlights with the De Hogger Flyer shows highlights from the 2012 pig hunting season in Hunter's Heaven, Louisiana. This year they had a thermal scope as well as thermal camera. The majority of the pigs are taken with a 308 equipped with an ATN Thor 640 2.5 magnification scope. Missouri Rabbit Hunt shows what fun you can have with a friend, a girlfriend, a video camera, and a pack of hounds. Track 'em Down Kennels is out rabbiting in the undergrowth, shooting whatever they fly. 
Gosh, some say we don't see enough paint drying on YouTube. I say we don't see enough match fishing. And here is why I am right and everyone else is wrong. Tom Ayres presents British Pike Championships Final 2012 in association with Go Fishing and Angling Times. Just two ounces separates the top two anglers' catches in a hard-fought British Championship on the Fen Drains. Staying in the Fens, cat fishing with Mark Barrett, Chasing Dreams Episode 3, Video 77, is presented by George Day, who doesn't look like he sees enough sun. In this film, he reveals why. It's his dream to catch a daytime UK catfish. Back to shooting, and there's a little competition going between YouTube channels in the USA as to who can set off the biggest legal explosion. This latest is from GY6Vids. Yeah, the one in Swordfish is much better. But watch this. Pick up the promo code and you do get to claim 20% off explosives at the sponsoring website. Kids, don't try this at home. You hardly get more charming, sensible and wonderfully British than Norfolk Pheasants by James Marchington. Gary Green hosts a day's driven pheasant and partridge shooting at the beginning of the season at Kilverston Hall Estate, Thetford in Norfolk. Two Barks Brandenburg Concerto No. 4 in G Major, which is of course the correct key for pheasant shooting in the eastern counties of England. Finally, beautifully filmed with lots of dog's eye view sequences, this Polish film could use subtitles. If you can forgive that, and any polls watching can forgive give my pronunciation of Muzlivi na Chiterek Lapak, then watch this story about a hunting dog's day on driven and walked up shoots. You can click on any of these films to watch them. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, if you like shooting, you will love The Shooting Show. On presenter Pete Carr's home turf, just half a mile from the East Yorkshire coast, it's the first day of the duck shooting season and he's been feeding the duck pond hard in anticipation. The area is host to every duck species shootable in the UK. As with any duck flight, the action is fast, furious and demands all of the pair's shotgun shooting skills. Meanwhile, Byron Pace interviews wildlife sculptor Ian Greensit, a specialist in sculpting game birds and game fish. If you're watching this on YouTube, click on the link to watch the show. We are back next week, and if you're watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's somewhere in the panel above me, or go to our show page, www.youtube.com slash show slash Field Sports Britain, where you can click to subscribe to just this show and not all the rest of the films we do. Or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you'll find an impressive array of DVDs. Christmas is coming up. Or you can click to like us on Facebook, or you can follow us on Twitter, or best of all, scroll down to the bottom right, pop your email address into the constant contact box, and we will constantly contact you about our programme, which is out every Wednesday, 7pm. This has been Field Sports Britain. <laughs> <laughs>